But writing, of course, is a solitary sort of profession, and it's just you and, and your keyboard. Um, and it's, it's a different thing altogether. Also, um, I can't use my voice, my eyes, my facial expressions to express things in books. Mm -hmm. They have to be written down specifically. That's another tool of talent um, that I've been trying to, uh, um, to perfect. Yeah, no, that's really interesting that 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 little anecdote you gave up top because like when I was kind of growing up and learning um, at first about literary power, I, I was very fascinated with this author named Jorge Luis Borges. And uh, he's got this kind of mantra that says like, you are who you are because of what other people make you up to be, you know? And, um, and that the only way to truly be yourself is the kind of Jack Kerouac approach of living alone on a mountaintop and looking for forest fires. You know, it's like, that's, that's when you can truly find out who you really are because there's no outside influence. Um, but anyway, I'm also very fascinated with your novel um, with the whole um, kind of choice to set it in an Elizabethan time, um, especially with, with the character being a kind of like a scientist of sorts. Right. So, to me, it, it, and like I know it's it's post Elizabethan with Isaac Newton, but to me, I always go back to Isaac Newton as the kind of like the revolutionary mind of that period. And I know Isaac Newton's a little bit post Elizabethan era, but like that was like the beginning, right? Of like people starting to use math and science to like solve crimes and like really get into those weeds. So you know, I was pretty interested that that was the kind of era that you picked to sort of write it? Well, there have been scientists ever since the ancient Greeks, uh, you know, for sure. <laughs> yes, for sure. And all sorts of people who use their minds to try to figure out what the natural world was about. Um, John Dee is just in the line of many people who were fascinated with the world and try to figure it out besides, you know, figuring out crimes, uh, which is what my novel is about. Uh, he was a master mathematician and well, went very far in trying to figure out, I, can't, I can never remember whether it's longitude or latitude, but he was very much instrumental in that. Um, and, and in fact, the calendar that we use in the United States, he developed uh, early on before, uh, before the, the church promulgated it, and, and certainly long before England promulgated it, mm. uh, that England continued to use uh, the old calendar was where, whereas most of Europe was uh, using the calendar that John Dee um, had worked on. Yeah, and um, what what kind of inspired you to choose this era? Was there was there a fascination that you came into it with? Where like, as you were picking, okay, I'm going to write. Was it always I'm going to write a detective novel? Was that a big part of your kind of you know uh, goal? Was to get into that detective novel genre? No, no, that was never had never had anything to do with my wanting to write this novel. Mm -hmm. um, you may or may not know that aside from being an actor, uh, I am a Shakespeare scholar and I teach Shakespeare around Los Angeles and other places. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare has been part of my life for more than 40 years. So the idea of writing about Elizabethan characters is second nature to me. You know, that makes sense. Write what you know. Well, I know a lot about it. If I turn the computer screen, you'd see a shelf of books all about Shakespeare and his times. Mm. So, um, I was interested in, in writing a story that was a detective novel because I didn't want to necessarily just write about history. I didn't want to write a history book. I wanted to write something that would entertain. And I thought the detective genre would do that. It would be able to allow me to deal with the history, to deal with the characters that I'm familiar with, and to tell a story I hope that will grab people. Mm. Um, and um, your, your uh, sort of Shakespeare uh, background um, allowed you to sort of create the world of the Elizabethan time. And is there actual references to events or like sort of Shakespearean themes that you try to embed into your novel? Well, absolutely. Uh, a lot of the things that I describe in the book are historical events. These things actually happen. Mm. As far as themes, uh, a great deal of the book deals with the characters of Twelfth Night, uh, who, which is one of Shakespeare's greatest plays. So I'm incorporating history and fantasy at the same time. But the history that I write about um, is all factual. 
it's, it all happened. And in fact, I've, I've tried to be very careful about everything that I write about in the books is factually correct. I have been told I've made some errors, which I'm, um, I'm, I'm sorry that I did, but, <laughs> but, but there aren't that many of them. There right. are, for instance, I write about grog, and it turns out there wasn't any grog until about 100 years later. But, grog, uh, grog the drink. That's right. That's right, right. right. So, but most everything I did a lot of research into, um, and all the events that I talk about really did happen in 1583, which is when the novel takes place, 1583 and 1584. Whether or not Shakespeare uh, was, was uh, tutored by John Dee is up for grabs, although there is some indication that that Shakespeare was familiar with John Dee's library, which was the largest library in England at the time. So, and John Dee is your protagonist. That's right. John Dee is my protagonist. Okay. See, I thought John Dee was was a made up character, but he's actually a historical figure. Absolutely, very historical. Very. I historical. see. I see. Uh, it, it's like saying Sir Walter Raleigh was a fictional character. Not so. Uh, he was. He was very much a part of his times. Yeah, he's not as famous as Shakespeare, but who is? Uh, but he was very much part of that time. He was a counselor to the queen. He did scientific experiments. He did mystical experiments. Um, and there is some, there is some few hints that some of the books that that uh, that Dee had in his library, which was extensive, uh, some of the books that were references possibly for some of the research that Shakespeare did. I'm not saying that that Shakespeare and Dee knew each other. But a lot of scholars have suggested that maybe there was a relationship between the two of them. And I ran with that idea. You know, what? one thing, you know, for me, when I was at NYU, one of the books that I was fascinated with, and um, I adapted it to a screenplay as one of my courses sort of asked you to create an adaptation was Christopher Marlowe's uh, Dr. Faustus. And I know that these are in similar sort of eras, you know, Christopher exactly Marlowe. Era. Exactly yeah. the same era. And, and the theme of Dr. Faust is, is so interesting because it is about this man who's willing to sacrifice all of his morality in the search for knowledge. And, you know, and, and like this incredible sort of mystical search for a science that is unknown by man and can only be sort of taught by gods and demons and stuff like that. Was Does Christopher Marlowe kind of play into your narrative at all? or It doesn't at all, although there is a book and I'm trying to see if I can see the title from here, and I can't. Um, I was given a book years ago about Christopher Marlowe, and, and that book was actually one of the incentives to write the Illyria trilogy. It, mm. it, uh, it, was, it was the facts surrounding Marlowe and his death, specifically his death, which is problematic, and no one's quite sure. Well, they know how he died. They just don't know why he was murdered. So Christopher uh, Marlowe was murdered. I didn't really know that. Yeah, he was murdered. He was stabbed through the eye, and oh uh, wow, in a in a brawl in a tavern. Uh, it's very likely. Uh, a lot of people think this. Of course, a lot of people think the opposite. That Marlowe was a spy, as John Dee was, mm. and and that uh, Marlowe was killed because one, he was an agent for the government, and two, he had um, um, agnostic views about God and heaven which made him an embarrassment to the government. And so the government just decided to get rid of him. Wow. And there's also like during the time of Shakespeare in love, maybe 10, 15 years ago, whenever that came out, there was also a lot of rumblings that people say that Marlowe wrote half of Shakespeare's plays. And there's all these kind of rumors that he was the ghost writer or that he actually wrote them. Is there any kind of historical you know, truth to that? Or is that just a bunch yeah. of... There is actually, um, but not as much as you think. There's been a recent study in the last year or two that Marlowe probably was the primary writer for Henry VI Part II, mm. which, which is which is a, conceivably the first play that Shakespeare's name is attached to historically. That, that was the first one that, that was performed. Uh, ironically, Part II came out before Part I. Hmm. Um, so uh, they've done some research with computers and word usage, and they seem to think that Marlowe was in was possibly the author of uh, Henry the Sixth, Part Two. Now, uh, shortly after that, this murder that I was just referring to took place. 
there are there are re government records of, of the uh, autopsy and the inquiry into his death. Um, so uh, I, one has to believe that he died when they say he died, mm -hmm. which would make him it would make him really uh, it would be impossible really for him to write uh, all of Shakespeare's plays. He he might have he might have collaborated on some of the other Henry the Sixth plays or possibly Richard the the Third, but it, that's unlikely. But certainly there is the possibility that Henry the Sixth Part Two um, was a Marlowe creation. And is is the character because I, you know, I like to write as well. Um, some things I've done professionally. A lot of things just sit in my computer, but I've tried to write in the language of Isaac Newton. That, you know, like I have a story specifically about Isaac Newton, and it's such a challenge to me, and it's so intimidating when you're trying to write about somebody whose IQ and brain power is exponential to anything that I will ever achieve. To sort of put myself in that headspace, did you have to kind of write for Shakespeare? Did you um, put words in his mouth? Yes, absolutely. I put words in his mouth. Um, I'm fortunate because I've spent my life performing Shakespeare around the country. So uh, I'm very familiar with his language. I've studied the sentence structure of, of his plays for a very long time. It's what I teach when I teach Shakespeare. Uh, so I am familiar with, with the way he put words together. It's called rhetoric. And uh, I am familiar with a lot of the instances that he uses in the plays. I also borrowed every now and then, uh, I guess we can call them Easter eggs. I borrowed lines from Twelfth Night to in insert into Shakespeare or John Dee's mouth in order to, as I said, to, to leave Easter eggs ar around the novels. And, and could you just like, because now, look, first of all, I, I obviously, and my audience is a bunch of nerds. We love to play video games and watch movies and, you know, science. I do a lot of science, you know, you know, physicist on the podcast as well. So obviously everybody's expecting me to talk about Star Trek and I'll get there eventually, but I'm fascinated about your kind of line of, 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 of topic for your, you know, for your novels. Could, could you give me a quick little background about who John D is the, uh, the protagonist? Yeah. John D was a, a Renaissance man who lived uh, in England, probably about, I would say about four or five miles from where Heathrow is now. So he was outside the city limits of London. Um, he was a great mathematician, as I said before. He was a great librarian, as I said before. Um, he was considered one of the geniuses of his age. He, um, he, he counseled the queen on many things, including the, her, the day that she was inaugurated. She was, he was both an astrologer and an astronomer. Astronomy uh, was, a, was considered a science at that time. As was, you know, astrology. Excuse me, astrology was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Astronomy uh, is a science, and um, he helped pick the date of her inauguration as a queen, Ooh. and for which uh, the queen was always very grateful. She uh, had always promised him that she would find a sinecure for him as a teacher, which is what he really wanted. But unfortunately, she never kept her word. But he did. He did do a lot of investigations for the queen. Um, he was a mystic. It, you have to remember that, that this is 1583. This was a time when the world is opening up to Europe. They are, they are finding new islands and peoples in the Pacific. They are finding out about the people in Cafe. They are finding out that the sun uh, does not go around the earth, but the earth goes around the sun. Mm -hmm. um, there are just new things happening all the time. D was had been told all of his life, as everybody had, that angels existed. And so he thought, if angels exist, there must be a way to talk to them. And so he spent a great deal of his life, besides his other academic studies and pursuits, he spent a great deal of his life trying to speak to angels and created uh, what he called an Anakian dictionary, which was a language, a language of angels. Oh, wow. um, fortunately for Mr. D, despite his good uh, intentions, um, some of the people that he worked with that that were screers, uh, the intermediaries between D and heaven, uh, were probably not to be trusted. And and though he believed in them and and and, uh, and took their 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 uh, word, um, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure he was uh, bamboozled by them. 
Mm. And that, unfortunately, is when you look up D, uh, that's primarily what you'll find is that he was some sort of crazed mystic that wanted to talk to angels. It's true. He did. But on the other hand, he was a scientist. He was a great mathematician. He wrote a very important book about geometry. Uh, he wrote many important books about uh, about navigation. Mm. Um, and he actually coined the term the British Empire, which had not existed before. Oh, interesting. So, um, a very important man. And, and, and again, and people used to come to study with him. Very famous people would come to Mortlake, which is the town that he lived in. They would come to Mortlake and study with him for long periods of time because he was quite, quite brilliant. So Steven Spielberg always says that in every great story or every great movie in his context, you can only ask the audience to make one leap, you know, like um, the, the DNA is found in the fossilized mosquito and that's how you get the dinosaurs. So how did you make your leap from what you knew about historical D to what you have in your sort of fictional um, sort of story? Excellent question. So, I knew about the characters of John B. I knew about the character of William Shakespeare. I knew about the other characters that populate my book as well. So the great leap is that D and Shakespeare are thrown together when Shakespeare is a young man. And mm -hmm. that this teacher, this amazing teacher who taught so many other people, also teaches Shakespeare. And, and Shakespeare uh, learns to be a great creative genius because of the lessons that he gets from John B. Mm. So is she so is so is Shakespeare? What's the age difference between the two? Just so I get a little on. Sure, uh, D is is considered an old man in his forties. That's where he is in fifteen eighty three. But he's in, in fifteen eighty three. Being forty was really very good. <laughs> right. Uh, Shakespeare in my book, and that's that's the one purposeful lie that I have in the book. Shakespeare should be eighteen or nineteen in fifteen eighty three, and I make him sixteen. Okay. Um, and uh, so the difference is between, in my book anyway, between a 16-year-old young man who is eager to learn and uh, an older scholar who is eager to teach. 15, and so it's the difference between 16 years old and 43 years old or 44 years old. And is young Shakespeare um, in your books, um, as the trilogy now with the third book that, that, that you've just wrapped up, does he get older or, or, or are you sticking with Shakespeare and all... He's a yep. main character in the trilogy. Uh, Shakespeare is not the main character. John D is the main character. Sure, sure, but is a one of the protagonists in the in the he's yes. he's in the trilogy. Yes, and yes, he's in the, Shakespeare's in the trilogy throughout uh, from uh, from the very beginning, actually, from the first page of the first novel uh, to within the last twelve pages of the third novel. Um, and and uh, yes, he gets older. He learns. Uh, he matures. He learns uh, about himself. He learns about the world that he's living in. He learns uh, what primarily the book deals with is the religious tension between Catholics and Protestants, which was huge at that time. People were mm -hmm. dying left and right because of their religious beliefs. And that is the core problem for Shakespeare and Dee to explore and to investigate, uh, which is the loyalty of a Catholic count to a Protestant queen. Elizabeth is a Protestant queen. Mm. And um, with, because Henry VIII predates Elizabeth, right? Sorry if my... Yes, yeah. Henry VIII is Elizabeth's father, yes. Is Elizabeth's father. Oh, really? Like, like that's how close they are to each other? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. I uh, mean, look... Elizabeth, it, Elizabeth is Henry VIII's, uh, I don't, uh, uh, if I have this right, fourth child, I could be slightly wrong, one died early, Arthur. Uh, no, that's Arthur. Excuse me. Arthur was, was Henry's brother. Uh, 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 Elizabeth is, is Henry VIII's third child. Uh, James is the first. He dies early. Mary, Bloody Mary, is the second. She dies uh, relatively, or not as early as James. And Elizabeth uh, reigns for a very long time. And she always attributed that long reign to John Dee because he picked the right date for her inauguration. She's always said that. That's interesting. And how does, what what are some of Shakespeare's traits when we first meet him? Is he that kind of brash, cocky guy that we see in Shakespeare in love? Is yes. he like- Yes, 
Yes, yes. he has a fresh cocky. He's younger than, than the than the Shakespeare and Shakespeare in love because that's a man probably in his twenties, maybe just well, coming to his thirties. But my my Shakespeare is sixteen. He's a boy. He's a boy. Um, and and uh, and he's failed. He's failed at writing. He's failed at uh, writing a play. And there is some possible historical truth to that as well. Um, and and he, he's beating himself over the head because he wants to be a writer, but he's failed. He's gotten really bad reviews on his first attempt. And, um, and so he's looking for a way to get better. And he finds, he finds the route to do that through studying with John D. But how... how... Just, just so I get a little historical context, how would a boy of 16 even have the chance to have a work published at such a young age? Uh, he didn't have it published. He, did, he was a playwright. He had a play put on, so it wasn't mm -hmm. published. And plays weren't, weren't really ever published until years later. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, Shakespeare never published his plays. Uh, the actors who worked in his company, years after Shakespeare died, published his plays. Although some of his plays were published... Um, uh, against every, they, they, they were stolen and then published because they were so good and, and, and people liked them. But Shakespeare never attempted to publish his own plays. Um, how did a boy of 16? Okay, so you're living in the 22nd or the 21st century um, and they're living in the, in the 17th century in the 1600s or the, or the 16th century, which is the 1500s. Um, life is entirely different. Mm -hmm. The average age of a London person in 1583 was 22. Oh, wow. So, uh, a, a lot of people were on their way uh, when they were 16. They, they didn't, you know, Shakespeare didn't go to college. He was working on his on his profession. And, um, and that's historically true. Which was acting, right? His primary profession was acting? His primary, his primary profession, well, I mean, historically, we know of Shakespeare originally as an actor. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, when he decided to become a writer, that's up for grabs. Um, but certainly, uh, historically and in my book, Shakespeare starts out as an actor and a, not a very successful actor. Um, and uh, his producer takes a big risk spot by allowing him to, to stage his play, which um, turns out to be a bomb. And as I said, there's, there's, um, there's, uh, there's some um, evidence that perhaps Shakespeare wrote a very early version of the play Hamlet that we know of today. Nothing like the play that we have today, but an earlier Hamlet that scholars call the Ur Hamlet, U-R dash Hamlet. Mm. It was a play that got really bad reviews that history is aware of. We just had no copies of that play. And, and um, there, there are scholars who suggest that perhaps a very young Shakespeare wrote that bomb. Wow, that's interesting. So John D, our main character, there's a few things I want to ask you about him, but just to wrap this kind of thread with Shakespeare, what is it about young Shakespeare the boy that makes D want to mentor him? Good question, great question. So um, uh, Dean needs to go on a, a, on a um, mission to explore, as I said, the loyalty of this Catholic count. Um, which is given uh, directly by the Queen, him and Elizabeth. Well, but, well indirectly by the Queen. Indirectly by the Queen. Man in between, a very famous historical man who was the spy master for Elizabeth. Absolutely true. This is historical. Francis Walsingham. Francis Walsingham uh, enlists D, forces D to go on this mission. And uh, D is, in my novels, is taken by the young boy. And what makes the boy attractive to D for this mission? is that in my novel, um, Shakespeare has a photographic memory and, uh, and therefore can be the witness to things and remember every detail mm. without John D having to write it all down and perhaps, Interesting. And perhaps be uh, uh, you know, found out because of things he's written down. And, and he wants to teach the boy, but the boy, William Shakespeare, is going to be an asset in his investigation. Wow, that's really interesting. I like that. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so so he basically, and that's where a little bit of that kind of, um, because in, in the description of your book, there's a reference to cryptography. Yes. Uh, and, and cryptography is also, you know, 
something that also comes up in like like you know Newtonian you know style stuff and how does that play into it um with with uh, sh with with yeah basically how does that kind of more something attributed to that kind of cyberpunk or uh, oh God, that's not the right word for it uh, steampunk that kind of steampunk genre how does that all play into it well again you're seeing this through the eyes of a 21st century uh person uh all because of the conflict, as I told you about before, mm -hmm. uh, in Europe and in England, a lot of messages were encoded, and it was the it was the job of of government officials, especially under Walsingham, who I mentioned before, to decode uh, these cryptic messages. Mm. And, and without giving away too much of my novel, part of the plot line is that some of these messages come into John Dee's possession. And he, as a cryptographer, which is one of the things he did, this is, this is one of the sciences that he studied. Um, uh, he spends uh, some time uh, uh, decoding these messages that help prove or disprove the mission that he's on. So one of the things that I've read as I was doing a little bit of preparation for this, for this conversation with you was that, um, you know, I, I've seen a few interviews and I've, I've seen a few written quotes that you say that you've brought in a little bit of the Quark character into John D. Is that no, an act? No, is that let me stop you right there. No, okay, you're, okay. You're, you're talking about other novels. Oh, okay. Those are different novels. Those are different novels. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, My apology. My apology. The Christian Prince series, which I also wrote, uh, that too is a trilogy. But uh, yes, that that's where I brought in Quark uh, as part of the characteristics of that John D. That too was our books about John D. But in fact, oh, okay. So then I was like fifty percent wrong because John D is also the protagonist of that trilogy. That's right. But that John D is more Quark than John D. And in fact, I sort of uh, swore to John D, the ghost of John D, <laughs> as I was finishing up my Merchant Prince books, that I would eventually write a book about the real John D and not a Quark like John D. Um, and so the Illyria series as I said, is very historical, very factual. And I tried to get inside the head and, and mind of John Dee. Uh, and the reader will have to decide how successful I am. But but there's no quark in my Illyria series. And in fact, uh, in, in, the Illyria, in the Merchant Prince series, there are Easter eggs, there are Star Trek Easter eggs that I drop here and there. And there's nothing like that in this. This, this is... Um, without denigrating my earlier work, this is a very serious work. I, yeah, I, yeah, um, yeah. No, you know, it sounds like um, like a fascinating read. I myself, in full disclosure, have not read it yet, but I'm kind of been prepping myself up, and now I'm getting a little bit more of that. You know, what a rare treat to get actual backstory and context from the author, you know, himself. Um, is this a, a trilogy now that you know you've done the third book that you will continue? in a different format, kind of like you had the last trilogy, now this trilogy, is there a next trilogy to make the full saga or? Well, this is the full saga. Um, I am 72 years old. I don't know how many more books I can write. <laughs> um, uh, my editor and my publisher are, are like yourself, sort of suggesting I go on and write some more novels um, about John Dee or, or anything else. And um, I've, I've said no for a very long period of time, but I have to admit, Recently, um, a, an idea is percolating in my head about another John D. novel, again, in this serious tone, mm. um, that would focus on an actual event in John D.'s life, um, which probably would not involve Shakespeare at all, um, but, um, but was a serious event and, and one that might make for a fascinating story. Um I'm very intrigued by this notion that you're saying one John D trilogy has a little bit more quark in it, if you will. And one is serious. Um, what kind of distinguishes the two things? Like, sure. is there a continuation? You know, there's some, yeah. No, there's no continuation. First of all, the Merchant Prince series, which involves John D, at least uh, the name John D is science fiction. It's science okay. fiction. Um, my, my other trilogy Illyria is a period mystery they are mm -hmm. they are they are only related by the fact that I wrote both trilogies 
and the, the character is called John D. in both. But the John Got D. It. in Merchant Prince is nothing like the real John D. He's poor with the name John D. So the so so, so the John D. Oh, I see. So the John D. in the first trilogy is not even in Elizabethan times. It has nothing to do. That's right. It starts out in Elizabethan times because <laughs> it's John D. But but almost immediately he's whisked away into the twenty I can't remember twenty second or twenty third century I can't remember uh, by by a dragon um, and um, <laughs> so yes it's science fiction there's it's it, there are things that I address in in the third book Capital Offense um, that unfortunately are coming true nowadays which I never thought they would when I wrote the books twenty years ago um, but but everything else is fanciful. So in the kind of spirit of, you know, Mr. Shakespeare, of being an actor, evolving into a writer, um, into a playwright, to be more specific, like you're saying, and with you of also being an actor, and I noticed that your first credit, it's actually fascinating, but your first credit is in Stardust Memories as a, as a background actor in, in Woody Allen's Stardust Memories. Is that accurate? Well, it depends on what you want to label my first credit. Um, First of all, it wasn't my first film credit. It, it wasn't this was a film and not a TV show. Uh, but by that time already, I had already done four Broadway shows. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would consider those uh, closer to my first credit than sure. the week I did. And, and although I'm not going to quibble about being a background actor, I actually was a principal, but um, <laughs> my ego getting in the way. But uh, <laughs> But but yes, it's like looking for Waldo if you're looking for me in that film. I, I think you hear my voice, but you don't see me at all. And uh, because this was like Woody Allen back in the old days when he was Gordon, I, I believe Gordon Willis. That's or, right. Or, was the DP, yes. Yeah, yeah. Gordon, you know, back in those days where he was firing on all cylinders, was it was it creatively energizing to be kind of in this new world and like be surrounded by these masters of our timing because back then there's no denying woody was kind of on the come up but gordon willis was already a an established master at that point well you, again I, I must point out your misunderstanding about a world um i was uh i i think i worked for about a week uh on that film and in that week I never had one word. I don't think I came within 50 feet of Woody Allen. <laughs> right. um, so, and as far as Gordon Willis, I think I can say the same about him as well. Sure, sure. Primarily me sitting around with a lot of other actors waiting for them to call us to go to work. And even when I got direction, which was minimal, the second AD, which is sort of low down on the totem pole, no offense to second ADs, but he would come over and say, Mr. Allen would like for you to do this and Mr. Allen. So I didn't get to talk. I talked to Woody Allen when I auditioned and he did most of the talking. Mm. I think I had two words, hello and I see. I think it makes two words. <laughs> right, right. Um, and, they, and they just cast me for my face. And, and in that film, there are a, a lot of wonderfully eccentric faces. Mm. I was yeah, because like Stardust Memories, if I'm remembering that one correctly, because I, I mean, I did the whole Woody Allen thing is kind of like his Fellini-esque, like, you know, sort of French Nouveau hybrid style thing. But in any case, the thing that obviously, you know, I, I definitely want to chat with you about is this beautiful character that you made that has influenced a lot of people's afternoons, evenings, mornings, you know, with Quark. And, you know, taking a character who in the next generation was kind of introduced as a member of a species that was antagonistic and, and slowly turning him into a family member is quite the, it's quite the arc, you know, for a character. And of course it's one that's only possible when you have seven seasons and 30 episodes per season and all that kind of stuff. But how did the sort of DS nine adventure start for you? Well, certainly it started on next generation from the very thing that you said, uh, mm -hmm. I was in the first episode that Ferengi were featured in. Of course. And, and as I've told uh, people many, many, many times, I was uh, ashamed of my performance. I, mm. I, was, um, I was very disappointed at what I did and, and the way they portrayed myself 
and, and, it, and I have no one to blame for this but myself. Please understand that. There's no one to blame but me. My performance was God awful and not anything what they wanted. I'm sure you're a fan of the show well enough to know that the Ferengi was supposed to be the new Klingons on Next Generation. Right. And, I, and unfortunately, they hired me and, and I made it rather comedic. I didn't purposely do that. Oh man, but that's the whole essence of the species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is not. It is. <laughs> it, it wasn't originally, and and I knew that. And 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 whether they're comedic or serious is really moot. What's in, what's more important to me, and what embarrasses me more, is that the performance was enormously one-dimensional. That mm. there was nothing of any depth. There was no humanity in it. That, that it was just a very comic, sloppy performance, very sloppy. And uh, and I regret it. We've got, it's been 30 plus years since I did it and I'm still regretting it. Hmm. And so that's where the journey starts for me. When, um, when I heard that they were doing Deep Space Nine and that the a Ferengi was going to be a series regular on the show, uh, I did everything I could to get an audition for Quark. And I've been told, I don't know if it's correct or not, but I've been told that I was one of the first people to audition for the part of Quark. And uh, about a month went by before I got any feedback. Now, my experience in TV is if you don't get feedback in the first five days, you didn't get it. Sure. Maybe somebody else. So when a month, month went by, I had assumed that they had passed on me and gone on to somebody else. Um, then after that month, I got a phone call asking me to come back for an audition, a second audition. And I went back and, uh, and did my audition. Um, and then about, I would say, eight to 10 days later, I had one more audition uh, where I, I sat, I stood in front of all the suits and Paramount and uh, did my audition for Quark. Now, that being said, it was, all my, it was always my agenda to resurrect the Ferengi from being one-dimensional into three-dimensional. Mm. And uh, I tried to infuse character, the character of Quark from the very start with a three-dimensionality which uh, the Ferengi had lacked in, in Next Generation. It, it was my mistake, my fault, my error, and it was up to me to rectify that. Mm. And so Quark was, was a seven-year attempt to, to do for the Ferengi what Michael Dorn had done for the Klingons. Uh, in other words, to make, make that species three-dimensional, to make it, it, they were never serious, because unfortunately, I put my my feet into the wet cement and created a comic species, but they were believable after a while. You may not have agreed with their ethics. You may not have agreed with their religion. You may not have agreed with their familial um, relationships, but they were believable. And I attribute it not just to myself, but to the great acting talents of Max Gredenchek who played Rom, uh, Jeffrey Combs who, who played Brunt, uh, um, uh, oh my God! Um, and the others who who played Ferengi, um, mm -hmm. and, and understand in order to do that, this is no secret either. But whenever there was a major Ferengi episode, I did something that I've never heard any other actor ever did, hmm. which was on the weekends when the actors weren't being paid and had other things to do. I would I would round up all the actors playing Ferengi, bring them to my house. And we would rehearse the scenes at my house for many hours, trying to explore what was the undercurrents in the script. Wow. What, what was there that's on the page? And, and what are the things we as actors could bring to the page? Because um, I, I was desperate to make sure all the Ferengi, not just myself, but all the Ferengi were three-dimensional. And they did an exceptional job. And, and every single one of them, every single one of them always came and always worked for the weekend with me. You know, as uh, you mentioned other folks that played Ferengis, um, I had the privilege 
of when I was a young man in New York, going to NYU, learning how to become a filmmaker and all that stuff, uh, to to get a little gig at a place called the Wooster Group. And um, when I was at the Wooster Group, I got to meet a man who to this day is one of the most impressive human beings I've ever met in my life, Mr. Wallace Shawn, who played the Grand Nagus. And for folks that don't know, Wallace Shawn is, is, is kind of this, um, you know, highly respected figure in the world of theater and-, and Wallace is one of the great playwrights of the American theater. Exactly. So um, did now that I'm hearing your backstory, did you get Wally in there or how did-, how did... Yeah, Wally came too. Wally came to my house as well. Not That's always. Right. Not always. I just got chills on that one because yeah, because I know what kind of man Wally is. That's awesome. Yeah. He he would come because he too, he we we all knew what the restrictions were wearing all that makeup. Wally more than anybody else, and and he too um, wanted to do the best job he could. And when I offered him the opportunity, as I said, he didn't come to all of them. I don't even think he came to most of them, but he did come to some of them. And uh, and we worked out the relationships in the house because we had time. We had time to make mistakes. We had time to talk to each other. We had time to talk about what was there, which, like Wally, myself being a theater actor, most of the actors that I'm talking about here are theater actors. Uh, we knew how important rehearsal was. And, mm -hmm. and the, the unfortunate situation of, of filming a TV show is there isn't a lot of rehearsal time. And you sort of go to the set, hope that the choices you made are the right ones, and and uh, you read it once or twice for the director, and 20 minutes later you're shooting it. There there isn't much time to craft a performance, so all of us theater actors were eager to take advantage of the rehearsal time that I was uh, offering to to look at the scenes. And, and and just out of curiosity, did you have anything because? I don't believe that the Grand Nagus shows up for the first few seasons. I could be wrong about that, but I, but but I think it's something that happens a little bit after the show gets uh, you know established. Did you have any part in bringing Wally into the mix? No, no. I, I, it's unfortunate for me. Uh, they loved Wally long before I didn't have to open my mouth. They loved Wally. They 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 brought Wally in. But it is one of the great regrets um, that I have, and I think all of the actors on our show had. Perhaps maybe maybe Avery had a difference, but it was a gr regret that we only got the scripts about 48 hours before we actually started shooting them. Oh, really? That's short. That very short. And and because of that, it was almost impossible to recommend actors for parts because by the time we got the scripts, they'd already had the script. Understood. Understood. And. Um... You know, you bring up Avery, and uh, you know, obviously, Captain Cisco is is such an incredible character, um, and you know, such a such a you know such an inspirational character. Uh, what was that experience like? And post that, we've seen that Avery, the human being, is quite the fascinating eccentric character. What 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 was it like, sort of working with him during the peak moments of DS Nine? Well, the Unfortunate uh, thing is, I didn't have that many scenes with Avery, so I didn't work with him that often. Um, but you're right; uh, he's an interesting uh, person. Uh, eccentric is probably a good way to put it. Um, he thinks on a higher level than I ever could. Yeah, and, he seems uh, like that. And uh, seems like I, he talks to angels as well. Perhaps he does. Perhaps he does. Um, and. Uh, our conversations were short, uh, except when he was directing the episodes. Then we had longer conversations. But um, but because we had so little screen time together, um, I had um, I had not much of a relationship with Avery because um, we really didn't work together. We were on the same show, but um, I can understand the writer's quandary about how do you put. Quark and Cisco uh, in the same scene without, you know, having an argument. Constantly. Sure, sure, sure. And that's why you, like, your scenes are typically shared with the doctor, with the chief, um, with your brother and stuff like that. Like, it, it, you know, it was more like that was the gang, right? Like, it was like a, 
like that group of folks, the folks that would hang out at the bar. That's right. It, the bar was the meeting place for everybody on Deep Space Nine. And so things were discussed there. And occasionally, you know, they might share things with my character, but primarily I was serving drinks to the, to the Starfleet officers. Um, so there wasn't a lot of rapport. Uh, rapport is the wrong word. There wasn't a lot of uh, back and forth uh, between me and, and uh, a lot of the characters. Mm. Uh, and, and, and because of that, I assume that's why they created my Ferengi family so that um, I would oh, that's have an interesting point. people to talk to who, who would to either take me seriously or fight against me w without causing the problems um, that would crop up uh, because Quark uh, wasn't always the most lawful person. And, and they were aspiring to be very lawful people, too lawful, I think, sometimes. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question, um, and I want to be respectful of your time. We're already 45 minutes into this, and I, and I have a few other things that I definitely want to ask you, um, but what do you think after all these years, you know, now it's been, you know, probably over 20 years, maybe even more than that, uh, definitely more than that, since DS9 uh, came on, um, you know, the air, probably pushing 30 years, like, 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 like you said, why it is it 30 years? Yeah. yeah. So why is it that? In, in retrospect, Quark might arguably be the most resonating character in the entire series. You have Cisco, you know, so it's really a, it's really kind of a a fun debate between Cisco and Quark. I mean, like it's pretty much one of those two characters. Why do you think Quark was able to resonate with everybody so much as the series went on, and even more so after the series ended? Well, I would say two things. One is he was the comic relief, mm. which always uh, um, ingratiates a character into an audience. Uh, they love comic relief. We have only to look at Falstaff or, or Festy or any of the characters from Shakespeare. It is the comic relief usually that the audiences love to see and, and laugh at. Um, and two... Um, I told you before that I wanted to make the Ferengi three-dimensional. Mm. And I'm sure people will, will push back against this, but it is my belief that Quark was the most human of the characters on the show. Oh, wow. Okay, and, and yeah. And because of that, because people saw the humanity in that character, um, they could identify with that character. He wasn't perfect. He was a rascal. Um, he was trying to get ahead. He had a, a, problematic, a problematic family. He had many of the problems and many of the vices and virtues of most people. He wasn't perfect. He wasn't Starfleet. Now, I, I'm a big Star Trek fan, and I, and I love the Starfleet character. But at times, there it's a, you have to scratch your head and go, really? <laughs> um, uh, and and the thing you can expect from Quark, uh, the thing you couldn't expect from Quark, is which way he would go. Mm. You could always sort of figure out where the Starfleet characters would go, but you weren't ever sure if Quark would do the right thing or not. Mm. Sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't, and I think that made him delicious to audiences. Yeah. And um, to sort of tie these two conversations together, um, I read that you also wrote a Star Trek novel based based around the character Quark. Was this one of your earlier sort of like um, novels? No, it was, actually, published? Uh, it was it was written after I did the Merchant Prince series. Uh, OK. So what had happened was. Um, we had pitched the idea of the novel to the Deep Space Nine writing team as a possible episode. They rejected it um, for whatever reason, and they're entitled to do that. And uh, we decided to uh, novelize it because, um, because we were writing novels. Mm -hmm. But a disclaimer here, one I've made before, don't make it often enough, but a disclaimer here, the novel Although I worked on the outline of the book and uh, was instrumental in, in where the plot was going to go, 
I did not write one word of it. I see. Uh, so, um, yes, I was part of the planning team, and my name is on it. As, but so is David's. David's. That David is the primary writer, the only writer. Uh, mm. uh, David and I worked out the plot with Eric, but um, but David wrote the novel. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, like to me, it was fascinating to see like um, that. You know, having made that assumption that you had worked on the novel, but it still holds true, is that Quark must be like um, a kind of an alternate, you know, like a, like another personality. Like you could probably extrapolate like almost any interaction in the context of Quark, right? Like that that character's brain and his his method of of reacting to things must be like a true other personality that's embedded in your body. Right. I mean, it's like, do you well, know him that well? You I think I, I did get to know him very well. Um, and he got to know me pretty well. Um, <laughs> sometimes we would fight. Um, but, um, you know, again, if, if you can pigeonhole someone, that's not good. Uh, right, right. If, you, if you think, oh, I know what this person's going to do. That's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't make for an interesting character um, because you know what they're going to do. They may have different words, but you know what they're going to do. Um, the, the brilliance of the, of the Deep Space Nine writing team was they created a character. And it's, they created it. I, I certainly helped, but they created it. They put the words in Quark's mouth. Um, and they, they wrote a fascinating character and, and more power to them that with my help, my little bit of acting help, they took a one-dimensional character and made it into perhaps one of the most interesting characters in Star Trek. Did you ever kind of come to peace with the regret that you had about, quote unquote, not doing the best job that you could with the, with the origin of the Ferengi to where you were able to take Quark? Did you feel like you accomplished your mission? I never came to peace with it. This is why I apologized again here today. Um, but I, I think if I didn't accomplish my mission, I came as close as I was possible of accomplishing my mission. It, uh, I, I don't think anyone can say of Quark that he's a one-dimensional character. Not at all, yeah. And that's, that was my agenda. Uh, and so to that extent, I did accomplish my agenda. Look, and to your point, one thing that Quark is kind of known for in my brain is that he's incredibly unpredictable. You know, to your point about being pigeonholed, you could kind of predict where Picard was going to go and just be amazed about how well he articulated his thoughts in, in perfect iambic pentameter, it seemed like every word he said. But with Quark, you had a situation, you never quite knew which way it was going to go. And like, you know, that made it fun to watch. Uh, yes, totally agree. Couldn't, couldn't say it any better than that. Um, and just to wrap up, I know that just recently you got to reprise the core character in the lower decks on the animated show. Was that fun? Was that something that you'd like to keep doing? Yeah, it was great fun. Um, I would like to keep doing it. Um, uh, I love the character of Quark. Uh, the great thing about animation is... <laughs> Uh, you know, I can continue to be Quark, and I don't, and I won't look like a seventy-two-year-old. <laughs> um, uh, as everyone must know by now, I, I found my Quark teeth and was able to use that for the animated series. Yeah. Quark is a, is a delicious character to play. I'm quite sure that when I'm buried, my tombstone won't say Armin Shimmerman; it'll say Quark. <laughs> uh, and and that's okay. And that's okay because I'm very proud of him. I'm very proud of the uh, of what we did together. And uh, I would love to do more of, of, of Quark. Um, and and I'm, I think it's indicative, if I may say this about Lower Decks, our, our show, Deep Space Nine, uh, when we were shooting it, and for years after we were finished shooting it, always lived in the shadow of other Star Trek shows. Mm. I think the, the uh, showcasing of Quark and Major Kira in Lower Decks is is an acknowledgement that our show deserves 
to get a little bit more credit than it usually does. Mm. And um, I'm very grateful to the creators of Lower Decks for giving both Nana and I and Kira and Quark an opportunity to, to show, to shine uh, one more time. I, I hope in, in their wisdom, they'll allow us to do it again. And, and just a plug, I hope that if we get to do it again, that they include some of the other characters um, in the show, because it would be great fun to work with them again. Oh yeah, man! It was such a beautiful show. I love Deep Space Nine, but then again, I'm, I'm a, I'm a big Trekkie. Like the only Trek I've never actually seen, really. I've seen a few episodes here and there. Is the original series, you know? Like I'm, like I'm of that era that came in with like you know Jean Luc and and you know all that stuff. But you know, anyway, just to go back to wrap just, this just up, just to make you jealous tonight. Yep. Tonight, Q is coming over for dinner. Oh wow. Wow. Oh God. Yeah. He was great. in. um, he was actually fascinating in, uh, in breaking bad. Um, his, uh, his portrayal of the father who loses his daughter and the Don air is, traffic. Don yeah. is a wonderful, wonderful actor and a good friend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he was my favorite part of season two of Picard was his performance. I thought he was really on the money, you yeah. know? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. He's, that does make me jealous. Um, I actually uh, covered uh, because I used to own a media company called Collider. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Anyway, I sold it already, but we used to cover the Star Trek conventions. And one time, just because we were such big fans, I would go myself and you and uh, John Delancey were, were doing signatures and you were both extremely gracious and kind to me. So I'll never forget that. And, and, and I'll never forget the beautiful work that you've put on the screen. And now I look forward to checking out the beautiful work that you put on the page with the Illyria trilogy. Um, it sounds fascinating. Uh, the two books are already available. The third one, is that yes. also available? It is not available, although the pre-orders have started already. The book, uh, the third book, which is called Imbalance of Power, put out by Jump Master Press, um, comes out on the 24th of January. Uh, mm. But if you go to uh, www.jumpmasterpress.com, Dot com, which is the publishing site, you can you can put in a pre-order uh, for not only the third book but the first two books if you haven't read the first two books, and or you can go to my website if that's easier to remember, uh, www.arnishimmerman.com, and and put in a pre-order there as well. Um, I'm very proud of these books. Um, if if indeed your listeners are looking for Quark, you won't find him in my book, <laughs> but but you will find some very fascinating people. Uh, some of which actually lived, um, and uh, it's a phenomenal time in 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 history, a time when a, a lot of things were happening that perhaps people nowadays have forgotten about. Beautiful. Man, this is such an honor for me, Armin. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I, I'm going to get all of the links that you just mentioned. I'm going to put them in the description of both the podcast and the YouTube video so folks can check it out. He's Armin Shimmerman, author, actor, uh, director as well. I'm sure you've directed plenty, right? I have directed a, a number of Shakespearean plays. That's what I direct. Um, and uh, uh, and this is a secret, but I will be doing another one uh, uh, soon. Very, Direct very cool. Is there any talk about maybe trying to create some sight and sound adaptations of the Illyria trilogy? I don't know what you mean by sight and sound. Uh, that's what we used to call it at NYU. It's always stuck with me. Nobody ever knows what the hell I'm talking about. Just like a TV or movie adaptation of it. Oh, I, I know. No. No. My whole purpose, um, as you can see, uh, I have agenda and I like to follow them. Yeah. My whole purpose was to write these books. That's uh, it. People ask me, you know, similar questions. Would you like to see this made into a film or a TV series or something? No, that never crossed my mind. Listen, if somebody were to buy it, I wouldn't say no. <laughs> right, right, right. But, but that, that is outside of my purview. I don't, I, I wanted to write these books. Um, and anyone who's familiar with my writing knows how much I put into language. Language is um, delicious to me. And, and although language can be put into a film character's mouth, it's not the same, and nor do you get the, the extent of the language in a film or a TV show that you can put into a novel. And, and being a classical actor, 
being uh, an English major for that matter, um, I am I am in love with language, and and you can only really do that successfully uh, if you're a writer. Beautiful stuff. I look forward to it. Armin, once again, thank you so much. Thank you guys for listening, and we will see you next time. Thank you.